The topic today is Christmas and the Christ. And this is a time of year where so many people are talking about the Christ. I mean, they even celebrate Christmas in Japan, which it really has very little religion there. And people all over the world. I mean, I was reading up on it. Some, some Jews even do it because they like the, the holiday. Most don't, you know, but they do. And, uh, you know, there's all, it doesn't matter. It, it's, a, it's a great holiday. It's a wonderful time. But while we were back east last week, my nephew visited us with my, you know, at my daughter's house, accompanied by his fiance. His fiance is Jewish. And, uh, and we were doing Christmas a week early to fit with people's work schedule. And, and she walked into the house and she was openly amazed at the colorful decorations. I mean, her mouth was open and her eyes were wide. She'd never been in a house where they celebrated Christmas before. And, uh, and she saw the gifts, the nice wrapped gifts and the, the colorful decorations and the, and the, the lighted tree with all kinds of different color bulbs hanging all over it and, and ornaments, the red and green theme and, and, uh, and all the excitement surrounding this time. So it was, it was new to her. She said that she'd never trimmed a tree, never received so many gifts at one time, and had never been a part of a Christmas celebration, which I find it hard to, to think, but she's raised uh, Jewish. And here are a few questions she asked me. She said, what's the deal with the decorated indoor tree? <laughs> Why do we have so many wrapped gifts? How does Santa fit into this whole Christ thing? <laughs> and where did the December 25th date come from? And those are the four things that she asked me. And uh, in that this, this girl's highly educated and participated in the debate club in college, especially revol uh, she liked the ones revolving around controversial religious practices, I think she had a pretty good idea of those, of those questions. She just wanted to hear what I was going to say. <laughs> and as most of you know, a majority of the well-kept traditions associated with Christmas have very little to do with Christianity. And, uh, and, and if you don't think so, then just try to explain them from the Bible to a non-Christian. The tree? <laughs> the gifts? Green and red? <laughs> Balls that you hang from your tree? I mean, it's, it's crazy stuff. It's fun. I love it. I love this time of year. Um, I was thinking, uh, or should I say, I ask you, what did Adam say on the day before Christmas? It's Christmas, Eve. <laughs> and why is Christmas just like a day at the office? Um, you do all the work and the fat guy in the suit gets all the credit. <laughs> And did you ever notice that the year that you stopped believing in Santa is the year you started getting clothes for Christmas? <laughs> um, studies show that thanks to spell check, one out of five children will be getting a visit from Satan this Christmas instead of Santa. <laughs> and... Did you hear about the two blondes that went deep into the snowy woods searching for that perfect Christmas tree? And after hours and hours of walking up and down the hill, searching high and low, one said to the other, I'm chopping down the next tree I see. I don't care if it's decorated or not. <laughs> Here's one for you politicos. How does Al Gore keep Christmas politically correct in his family? On Christmas morning, they give presents to the tree. <laughs> and finally, I was thinking that I can't wait to see what movie North Korea will allow me and my family to watch this Christmas. <laughs> so, can you explain the Christ? Can I explain the Christ? 
Have you ever tried to explain the purpose of the birth of Christ to a non-Christian? I mean, where do you start? You say, let me see. There was this unmarried teenage girl from Judea who an angel tells her that she's going to have a baby, even though she's never had sex, and, uh, and also tells her this child is going to be the savior of the world. And she says, sounds like a plan. And, uh, and then he's born in this small town called Bethlehem. Then they move eventually to an even smaller town called Nazareth, about 65 miles north of there. So he was basically a country boy, Jesus. And wise men at one time came from far away to visit him when he was a small child. And the politicians tried to kill him when he was a toddler by killing all the kids surrounding Bethlehem under two years old. This, this kid was brought up, this kid Jesus was brought up to be a carpenter, probably was a pretty good one. And remember, I'm t- trying to tell you about this Jesus guy. And when he was about 30, he rounded up a posse, began speaking and spreading the truth, doing miracles, healing people, did it for about a year or so. And, and uh, the religious leaders felt threatened by his presence and, and how people were, were so enamored with him. So they tricked the Romans into crucifying him. And he died. And then he was buried. But three days and three nights later, he rose from the dead, threw his grave clothes, and, uh, you know, to be with uh, God and said he would someday return. Now, if you're a Christian, you understand this and you're all nodding your heads. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that's a great story. You know, but um, did you know that the Jews today are still waiting for the Messiah? They're still waiting. Talk about missing the party. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll see him when he comes back, somebody said here. <laughs> they'll, all, they'll all know he's back then. Because <laughs> it won't be the same. He won't come, come like a baby floating from heaven. <laughs> Maybe he will with stubby little wings, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Crazy stuff. Um, the first prophecy, and you just listen up. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. I'll read it from the voice translation. And this, this voice translation is interesting because it, it's a dialogue. It has who's saying what when. So here it says, God to the serpent. What you have done carries great consequences. Now you're cursed more than cattle or wild beasts. You will writhe on your belly forever, consuming the the dust out of which man was made. I will make you and your brood enemies of the woman and, and all her children. The woman's child will stomp your head and you will strike his heel. That's basically the first prophecy that there was going to be a Christ, a Redeemer, a Messiah. And... Um, Now, God was talking directly to the serpent, but it must have been loud enough and in a way that Eve could hear. This wasn't told to Eve. See, God promised that he would send a man born of a woman who, after taking a hit, would ultimately defeat the devil. You know, and... uh, And, you know, that's sort of some big, heaping, you know, shoes to fill, isn't it? You know, that you're, gonna, you're going to ultimately kill the, the enemy of the universe. And uh, to el- eliminate evil and to save the world, that's quite a, that's quite a claim. And uh, see, Eve must have overheard and believed what God had said. And so uh, Eve and Adam got busy trying to make this thing happen. And in Genesis 4.1 from the God's Word translation... Um, it says, Adam made love to his wife, Eve. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have gotten the man that the Lord promised. So she thought this first child was going to be the one. Now, another translation, the International Standard Version of 
4.1 says, Later, Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, sexualations, <laughs> <laughs> and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have given birth to a male child, the Lord. Now, so this is translated. She thought she had given birth. She thought the first, her first child would be the Messiah. See, even Eve thought she had given birth to the promised one. You know, but in actuality, this firstborn human became the first recorded murderer. He killed his own brother named Abel. I think her plan for humanity didn't start off too well. <laughs> I mean, just think, these guys, Adam and Eve were perfect at one time. Every thought was perfect. All they knew is community and, and communication with God. That's all they knew. They had dominion over the earth, everything they wanted, and they traded it all for whatever, for something else. And then, she, then, she, then he says, hey, he's talking to the devil. You know, the woman's going to have a, a kid and, uh, and he's going to crush your head. Now, there's a bit of time between this, but Eve thought it was just, this is just a natural flow. I made a mistake. Let's get things going. Let's straighten things out. You know, did you know that there's at least three constellations that de depict a hero crushing an enemy with his foot? If you look at a, at a planisphere, which I, I'm not showing, uh, you could look it up in any of them, but just look at the uh, the very center of the heavens. There, you got Hercules stepping on the head of, of Draco, and then in another portion, you see this other constellation called Ophiuchus stepping, uh, crushing Scorpio with his foot. You know, and then there's one Orion. You've seen Orion's belt in the sky, and he's trampling Lepus, which is the enemy. So those are at least three. But, but the, it's, it's wild stuff. You know, talk about planning a pregnancy and planning out somebody's life for them. Now, us parents have all tried it and usually failed horribly. <laughs> you know, we want our kid to do this, so they do this. I wasn't any different. I mean, these are life goals that, that are set for the Messiah. See, Jesus, when he was a child, he knew exactly what the plan was for him, what God's plan for him was. Exactly. He knew what he was supposed to do, and he still knows what he still needs to do. There's things that are, that are written in the, the, the stars, so to speak, that have, never, uh, um, that have not yet come to pass. You know, there's a lot of things that's still in the works. You know, men, many think that the entire story and timing of the Christ is alluded to in the constellations. And King David mentioned it a few times. And uh, how do you think the wise men knew basically where he would be born and when? If they could know that, and they weren't even of Israel, they would be considered unbelievers. But because of what was handed down to them and what was taught, they were able to, to almost locate him. They got a little help from some Judeans in, in Jerusalem, you know, who the wise guys that surrounded Herod. So it's, it's wild. If they could, there must be something to it. Must be something to it. Like Psalm 19 from the message, you know, verse 1 through 4 says, God's glory is on tour in the skies. Godcraft on exhibit across a horizon. Madame Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures each evening. Their words aren't heard. Their voices aren't recorded. But their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. Yeah, there must be something to the story of Christ spoken in the stars. See, um... You know, when I was a teenager and I first heard about the Magi following a group of stars, not just one star, um, you know, I, 
I wondered what kind of truth was was in the stars. I mean, I'm not talking about astrology or astronomy. You know, I mean, it, it's it, we're talking about a story that ha- that gets handed down. So I drove out to the desert in West Texas. Me and another guy, and we didn't know much, but we we thought maybe we could figure this thing out, and uh, and we drove out. Uh, on this caliche road, this gravel kind of road, got way out there, and the stars were th- so thick in the sky, you could see the Milky Way going across. I mean, I felt like I could reach up and touch the, the stars. There were so many and so thick, and I stared and stared and stared and pondered with my friend and trying to figure it out. And, and it would have been easier for me to touch the star than to try to figure that out on my own without any help, because it didn't, I didn't know where to start or where to end. And uh, see, most of the people in the world, including many intellectual Christians, don't believe in an act of Christ. They might have believed he was born. They might have believed he's a savior, you know, baby Jesus, you know, you know whatever. But they don't, they don't know. They just, they just don't, they've stopped believing, or they just never really understood it enough to, for it to make sense. See, between, uh, between 1 and 7 B.C., and nobody really knows for sure, was the birth. Some highly attest to 3 B.C., some say 1 B.C., some say 7 B.C., I, and they all sound convincing when you read it. So it's, it's really hard to tell. But we know it was a few years before because Herod, the guy who was out to kill him, well, historians say he died in, in 4 B.C. That would mean Jesus had to be, be born earlier. But then there's other historians say that he really died in, in uh, 1 B.C., I just saw that this morning when I was saying, okay, so I just don't know. You know, so I, I just, I don't know. There's so many books and papers written on it. Um, but, uh, you know, we all know Jesus was born in a manger and that a group of shepherds have been told by an angel where to find this special child. And Luke chapter 2, verse 7 from the Amplified, and she gave birth to her son, her firstborn, now, you know, there was, he had a number of brothers and some sisters, Jesus did. It's easily documented. In fact, two of his bro- stepbrothers, half-brothers, half-brothers, not stepbrothers, two of his half-brothers wrote epistles, you know, one James and Jude. You know, so they made Jesus Lord at one time in their life. Pretty crazy. There are only two of his siblings that it ever that it ever even mentions after the day of Pentecost. But she gave birth to her firstborn, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room or place for them in the inn. Now, most of you know what happened is that Roman government said, you know, they wanted more tax money. They wanted to record all this stuff. And and, and so uh, they had everybody go back to their, their ancestral um, areas. Joseph was of the tribe of David, so he went back to Bethlehem, the city of David. And so there's so many people coming in from all over the world, basically, to their ancestral inherited land that uh, there wasn't room. It's like if you've ever traveled and there's like a NASCAR race in the city, you're not getting a room. Or the Balloon Festival in New Mexico. Go there during the Balloon Festival. If you don't have a room a year in advance, you're not getting a room. You're going to have to go somewhere else. Go to Santa Fe or something. So, uh, uh, but it, there was no room. But so, so, the, so to appe- they, the people had to go there. So they, met, they put out fresh hay and people were able to sleep um, in what would be called a manger where animals would normally be. They weren't laying on cow patties, I'm sure. And they probably somebody would have tried to make it as comfortable because visitors were a big deal in the Middle East. 
travelers. It was a big deal. It was very important to take care of strangers. So, and swaddling clothes, I mean, most of the translations say a blanket, but there's more truth behind that. Um, and not to get into great detail, but the, to swaddle was only done to a child that would be royalty. Here there's two teenagers, Mary and Joseph. They were told this kid's going to be a king. And so they knew what was supposed to happen. So now these two kids are in this manger. And they, and they go, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. They wash the kid a certain way. They wrap him in these little wrappings. And uh, for a particular reason, he would be, he'd be more upright and whatever. And, uh, and, then, um, and then they unwrap him and, and go. But while this kid was wrapped for that minute or so that he would have been wrapped, because a baby would be comfortable being wrapped up, right? I mean, they, they like the tight wraps. Yeah, most do, not hers. And, <laughs> you know, and uh, so it wasn't like torture, you know, and it wasn't like a baby mummy, mummy Jesus and his mummy, you know, <laughs> mummy Mary, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, so they did this, and right at that moment, um, which we'll get to in a minute, that's when the shepherds appeared. So it's pretty wild. And, and really, this is, the, this is sort of the, um, where I thought about that joke last year, you know, uh, how they, uh, you know, there, there, there's a Bible record that talks about Jesus lying, you know, that he was, they caught him lying in the manger, in the shepherds, you know, so I know it's bad. Um, then verse 15 through 18 of that, that same er, uh, section, as the angel choir, let me see, yeah, that same chapter, verse 15, as the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the sheep herders talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. And they left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Right where the angel told them it would be. Seeing what seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the sheep herders were impressed. 19 through 20, Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within herself. The sheep herders returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they had been told. Now, where it says Mary Potter th these things, remember, she's a kid, a middle teen. And now you've, you, knew, you were told by, you, you've, uh, you've been visited by an angel. You've had other women prophesy and tell you it's going to happen. Now these shepherds come all the way. They left their sheep. They run into town. <laughs> you know, and then they, they look over this baby while it's still swaddled. Maybe she, you know, she was just beginning to get ready to undo it. And they're saying, angels just told us this stuff's going to happen. One started, and then a whole bunch of them appeared. So we hightailed it down here to see for ourselves. And she's like, what the? I mean, a young lady and a young man sitting there with this little baby. And now everybody in town has heard. What do you think the townspeople would have done? They would have come to see. So now this, this little scared girl, maybe, you know, and, and her young husband, they're, they're laying there exposed, you know, to anybody who wants to walk by his eyes, and everybody's gawking. They're trying to see this thing that the shepherds told them about. She pondered it in her heart. What is going on? That's not the only time she did this. When he grew up, she did the same thing before. 
kept it kept it all in. I mean, this is this is some hard, heady stuff. Um, but I was thinking about trying to make sense of things, and without a spiritual mind, this is very difficult stuff to understand. But you can, because how could you get born again if you couldn't understand spiritual things somehow? So, uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 and 15 from the Amplified, it says, But the natural, the non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God, for they are folly, meaningless nonsense to him. And he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding, and becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. But the spiritual man ties all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into, questions, um, and discerns all things, yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. Nobody can really understand why you believe what you believe. And the truth that you understand can be greater than what I understand. Because we're all at different places. And just because somebody doesn't understand the spiritual things you talk about doesn't mean that you are wrong. And people love to try to convince you that you're wrong, especially regarding the word. Just go to college. You know, a lot of college professors, if you take psychology and, and uh, philosophy, they're going to try to uh, dissuade you of these things. See, the Bible says that uns the unspiritual cannot understand the spiritual. So, so stop second-guessing your beliefs. You know, somebody, just because somebody says that Jesus Christ didn't heal anybody doesn't mean that he didn't heal anybody. They, they, and so remember, uh, somebody who's, who's a natural man or an unspiritual person, they can't understand this. And they can't understand you. And you can spend a lot of time and get into great arguments over a, a, uh, a stein of beer <laughs> where all the heavy arguments, you know, <laughs> happen sometimes. And, and, uh, and you're, you're not going to get anywhere, you know. So, you know, just, just believe what you believe. Um, so... Uh, you know, over a year passes now since this child was born. Over a year. And when Jesus was a toddler, the wise men came to see him and gave his family gifts. Really gave him and his mom. And they didn't visit him in a manger on the day he was born. I'll say that again. The wise men never appeared in the, at the manger. It just, it, it's not a biblical concept. It makes very nice greeting cards and sweatshirts, right? Wise men still follow him. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's wild. And uh, so um, Matthew 2, uh, 10, and, 10 and 11 from King James, when they saw the star, they rejoice with exceeding great joy. And this is talking about the wise men. And they were coming to the house. Coming to the house. The kings are in the house. <laughs> and uh, I guess the king was in the house. And they were coming to the house, not the manger. They saw the young child. And if you look up the word young child, it means a partially grown human. Partially grown. Now, we don't know, was he 10 here? Was he 2 here? We don't know from this verse. Um, and when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Doesn't even say Joseph. 
and they fell down and worshipped him. Now remember, the word worshipped in King James just means to respect. And the way people would do that is they'd, they'd like bow down. You see the Japanese bow. They would get on their knees and bow. It's more of an Eastern thing. It doesn't mean they, they prayed to this baby Jesus like you might have heard in a, uh, a comedy, you know, a few years back. You see, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts. Now, here's the gifts. Gold. How many of you would like to get gifts of gold? Okay, four of you. That's good. You know, uh, frankincense and myrrh. Now, they don't mean much to us, but they use frankincense in their ceremonies. And, uh, and then uh, myrrh would is just, these are all super crazy expensive things. These oils and, and uh, essential oils and such. And did you notice that only the child and his mom were present in the house? No other kids running around. No donkeys. Yeah. Wasn't camel. I don't think even a drummer boy. Maybe. But I don't think so. But it, it, it mentions three expensive gifts, but never tells us how many wise men visited Jesus and Mary. So we don't know. Was there three? Could be. Was there a hundred? Could be. But how many gifts did they give? Three. That's all we know. Probably in a caravan where they're, where they're bringing lavish gifts and these guys are wise men, they probably had security detail with them. So there's probably a number of people that did this. They came from another land into a, a foreign country. And, um, see, they, um, see, and after this visit, the, an angel pretty quickly warned Joseph to take his wife and child to Egypt. Now imagine being 14 or 15, and now you have to go to, to a, definitely a foreign country. I mean, leave your, your aunts, your uncles, your parents. Their parents are probably still alive. Their parents are probably in their 30s, Joseph and Mary, because if they're, if they're 15, 16, and their parents were that when they had them, their parents are in their 30s. Hair hadn't even started changing yet, you know, color. So it's, it's, it's a, just different to think this stuff. And um, so now one thing to also realize, I used to think that Egypt was was a dangerous foreign country. Well, it was a different country. But remember, it's still part of the Roman Empire. Rome owned Egypt. They took it over just like they did Israel. So they had their Colosseums. They had their markets. They had their culture embedded in, in Egypt just the same. So would travel have been easier? Yeah. Just like is it easy for us to travel to Puerto Rico? Yeah. It's, it's, part, it's part, of, you know, part of America, basically. Or Guam. Can you go to Guam pretty easy on American passport? Yeah. Easy. So, um, so here we are. You know, they, they had, and remember, what was one thing they had been given that would be able to be used as currency in any country? Gold. So however long they stayed there in Egypt, they had the money to do it. So it's pretty cool how God set it up. And when I was reading this this morning, I was thinking about us. What is God, what, what has God done for us? And what is he willing to do for us so that we can accomplish our task, our mission? Do we even remember our mission or do we know it? You know, I think a lot of, a lot of Christians don't think they know, but they actually do it. They live well. They take care of people. They, they live above the senses. They live beyond what most people do, you see. And I think, I think you, you know what you're good at. Well, after the visit by the wise men, King Herod had all the boys in, in Beth, the Bethlehem area, he talks about Bethlehem and the coasts, uh, killed under t who were two years of age and under. Now, who could do that? Just imagine, you know, the, the, the governor of Colorado saying, 
all kids, all boys two years and under in Colorado Springs are going to be put to death today. I mean, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre thing. But, but he knew that the, these, these kings, these wise men, said that a king was being born. And so would, could that be a threat to a uh, uh, megalomaniac, to an egotistical jerk? Oh, yeah. Because this guy thought, I mean, he'd reigned for a long time. Um, you know, Herod wanted to kill anyone who, would, who could challenge his throne. Herod was an ethnic Arab who forced his way into Roman politics. And he became a local king, what we might call a governor of a state, would, would, they would have called a king. Just like in the, in the medieval days, he had kings over cities. A king wasn't necessarily a king of a whole country. It was a king of a city. The Chinese did the same thing until somebody beats them all up and then takes over the whole thing. And then you have one kingdom. And uh, so Herod was a brutal man who killed his father-in-law. He killed a few of his ten wives and a couple of his own sons. For political pull. So if he would kill his own family, did this mean anything to him? Nah. No. It meant nothing to him. Because it didn't, it didn't phase his, his reign a bit. Matthew 2.16 from the message. Herod, when he realized that the scholars had tricked him, I like how they call these wise men the scholars. Now these scholars, these wise men, these, these kings, so to speak, what they were is they were, they were Zoroastrian magi. They were trained in the knowledge of the stars. And there was much knowledge handed down. There was a guy who had been in their kingdom prior to them called Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these guys taught them these stories that were written in the stars. And there's more than, than we will ever know because for them to know the timing of things, uh, there was a lot of stuff handed down. They would be what we today would, would be like nuclear scientists. You know, these, these, uh, you know, they would be people who under, would understand high math. I mean, what they would understand would be some of like our smartest people in the world. That's who the wise men were. They were wise men. They were scholars. They followed this and tracked it and talked about it and watched it. They worked the night shift. They watched this stuff all the time. The stars, reading things, trying to figure things out, you see. And then all of a sudden, all these things that had been written down hundreds of years prior to them, they're starting to see, boom, 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 these different constellations going, you know, meshing and different things happening, boom. They figured it out, but they couldn't pinpoint it where the Christ was born. And so they went, they knew it was Israel, but they didn't know where, so they went to the capital and talked to Herod. And when he, Herod realized the scholars had tricked him into telling them where this Christ was to be born, he flew into a rage. And he commanded the murder of every little boy two years old and under who lived in Bethlehem and its surrounding hills. He determined that age from the information he'd gotten from the scholars. So this sets the time. Jesus was under two years old. Herod was still alive. See, Jesus didn't have an easy start, but he finished well. And how does Christ affect us today? And doesn't it say in John 14, 12 that we can do even greater works than Jesus Christ did because he, he went to his, uh, his Father? You see, it says that we can do all things through Christ, Philippians 4, 13, that God will supply all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 19. That Christ is formed in us, Galatians 4, 19. That we have Christ in us. Colossians 1.27, that we can have exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, 
It's because of the work of Christ, Ephesians 3.20, that we can prosper and be in health because of that Christ, 3 John 2. I mean, look at all the benefits that we're super conquerors through him who loved us. See, Christ thought beyond his years. He lived bigger than his life. And I think if we can think that way, think bigger than ourselves, think bigger than our life when we make decisions and actions and set goals and do things, my God, what can happen? The last section I want to read is just something that Jesus Christ said, but it it, it impresses me. It's Matthew 18, 18 through 20. And he said, take this most seriously. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. And a no on earth is a no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. I mean this. When two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. Now, Jesus Christ said this. I mean, that mean, how much power do we really have? And he's talking about the power of the group, the team, the family. You know, isn't Christ saying here that the power of the universe is at our fingertips? We really do. We really have no lack. And those things we're still working out in our heads, just keep working on them. You'll get your answer. Why not? See, this is an example of what Christ accomplished for us because of his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Not to, not to mention he's coming back for us, but it all started with his birth and his training. But then he had to decide to be the Christ. He was chosen to be the Christ. The Bible says that it talks about the first Adam and the second Adam. You ever read that? The first Adam was Adam and Eve. The second Adam was Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible, so they're like, and they, they started off with the same, they have the same potential perfection there. One failed at his mission. One succeeded. For us. He lived, he lived big and he still lives big it said if two two or three of you are together because of me because of the christ you can be sure that i'll be there what does that mean is that just a light comment or could in fact the christ actually moving at whatever speed he can move at actually visit every time christians get together in his name Is it just hyperbole? Is it an analogy? Is it just talk? Is it just dialogue? Or is there something to it? I believe there's something to it, just like there's something to the Christ. See, that lighted Santa may illuminate those manger scenes in your front yard. You see... But it's the light of the Spirit of God that's going to guide us through life because of what Jesus Christ accomplished. See, Christmas may not be the exact time of his birth. You know, the exact time of year. Probably wasn't. You know, but it's great this is the one time of year that Christ is highlighted. Now, not with Santa. (laughs) You know... You know, but, but in conversations, he's highlighted. So let's take the time to learn about, to talk about, to celebrate the birth and the accomplishments of the Christ. That's what makes us different, folks. That's our only advantage in life. You see, let's live above the world by living in that love of Christ. 
Let's learn to live like Jesus Christ designed us to live, that God designed us to live. And I always think if he can do it, we can do it. Because we can do the same works that he did. So Santa may say, ho, 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 Merry Christmas. Uh, But God's saying, ho, 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 it's Christ in you. Let's live it together. God bless.